This week, what's happened to fake news? Click here. What's happened to the real news reader? Click here. And remembering the First World War, a hundred years on. The news. We used to trust it. If it was on screen or in print, we believed it. But a few years ago, the lies online started to look really realistic. Phony news websites with convincing looking stories shared by your friends on social media. The fake news era was born. And once we'd all become aware that fake news was a thing, the term spread and the meaning blurred. The fake news. The fake Fake news. Fake news. Fake. Fake. They have to leave that word. We have a lot of political actors that have been weaponizing the term fake news to discredit any kind of media um, that they don't think is favorable. I'm you, not going to give you a can question. You can you stay categorical? You are fake news. The social media platforms are trying to spot and block fake news websites. But the problem is, a lot of the time, the lies are woven in with truths and opinion. It's just all too hazy. There are headlines that are actually truthful, but then maybe the information doesn't match it. Um, so there's really many different layers. So misinformation is not just that one big lie that is being spread with a big headline, but there's a lot of things that are more nuanced. Fake news is used and referenced for many reasons. To destabilize, to create doubt in the mainstream media. But in Eastern Europe, it's always been about the money. 18 months ago, Carl Miller visited Kosovo to research the fake news industry there. And now, as part of the BBC's fake news season, we've sent him back to see how Facebook's war on fake news has changed the landscape. The thing that really intrigues me about Kosovo is that this is the youngest country in Europe. It's got one of the best internet connections in Europe. And the internet is really seen as one of the main drivers to gain access to international markets and work. 18 months ago, these factors meant that Kosovo's fake news industry was bustling. But after the social media clampdown, what, if anything, has actually changed? It's really, it's wild these days. It's wild, yes, because a lot of people make a lot of money. My journey begins meeting Gaz. It is hard to get fake news merchants to speak on camera, but Gaz says after several years he's now given it up. But he certainly seems to be well plugged into the scene. Here he is showing me an invitation-only closed group on Facebook, where fake news merchants swap and sell and trade secrets. This is, start, this is a starter pack yeah. for fake news. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'm told that up to 40% of Kosovan youth are involved in fake news. Who could be a fake news merchant? Everyone who owns and knows how to use a computer. Do you have to be like technically savvy? Do you have to know how to code? Not, not really, not really. <laughs> Even to get around all of kind of Facebook's detection uh, muscle, techniques? Most of these uh, fake news merchants uh, copy, paste these stories, you know. Gaz tells me the scene is still very active. But as Facebook has clamped down, the focus of fake news merchants has started to shift. The way you make money like this online is to get as many people as possible clicking on your content. The more clicks, the more you can make from it. Platforms like Facebook can pay for your clicks internally, but you can also get paid by taking people to external websites where, again, how much you get from ads is based on the size of your audience. Before the clampdown, the best way of getting the clicks was pushing out fake news. But since then, many people spreading fake news have started to weaponize other content. Fake news merchants have now morphed into clickbait merchants. 
This could still mean posting fake and misleading stories, but it increasingly means posting pictures of scanty clad women, flashy cars or celebrity gossip, anything really which gets eyeballs, even when it's obviously untrue. I have heard there are thousands of people scattered around Kosovo making money like this. But it's all very secretive. Eventually, one such successful clickbait merchant agreed to talk to me. I had to travel out of Pristina in the dead of night to meet him. The easiest trick is to have a page that you know is going to sell more because you know it's going to be clicked on, but you don't actually know what's being shared. In this group, say I have a page with 300,000 likes, I put up a price of 1,300 to 1,400 euros. It all depends on what kind of audience I have. If my page fans are from the US, top USA, the price will be double because pay-per-click is better for that audience. As a first step to growing audiences, he opens multiple Facebook accounts with fake IP addresses. Yes, I can open 10 tonight with different IPs. Some will get shut down, some not. It depends how well you can cheat Facebook, really. So do you spoof IPs? We change our IPs so that we don't all open accounts from the same address, because otherwise Facebook will spot it and shut them down. And then he adds eye-catching content to get the clicks in. There are different ways. We sponsor ads and open fake profiles, mostly of girls, and then we like pages with these profiles. And we'll also share the pages among the pages we already have. So you, you, you like grow a new page um, by linking it to one of your more, more mature pages, and when that's got to a big enough size, you might sell it. Yeah, that's how it works. For instance, I have a page with cars that has 200 to 300,000 likes. When I posted the new page I'm trying to grow it on, I can easily get 10,000 likes. In just an hour or two, I can get two or 3,000 likes from that original posting. And there's a lot of money to be made from this. I have a page about cars with 100 or 120,000 likes. I bring that onto my Facebook page and with that audience, I can earn 50 to $60 a day. With several such sites, it comes to hundreds of dollars a day compared to, say, the average salary of $300 a month. There's absolutely little wonder that this is happening on an industrial scale throughout Kosovo. Would you recommend that career for young people now? Yes, of course. For anyone who can get around and understand this world, it's worth it. You'll never be broke. I came back to Pristina to see more about what's going on under the bonnet of the fake news industry. The Facebook closed groups that Gaz showed me was where the buying and selling of pages and audiences was all happening. He's selling Facebook pages, thousands of followers. Here he's showing me a Facebook page with 189,000 likes that is up for sale, but you can also place orders. This person is asking for a website that will generate daily traffic of 10,000. But all this buying and selling of pages with huge audiences or false accounts of fake likes or fake IP addresses, it's all against Facebook's rules and this community knows how to work around the system. And so this is constantly happening, these groups are shut down and start up again, shut down yes, and start up yes. again. Because, you know, these people know each other so they work together again, you know, inviting people, those who are interested, people know each other, you know. And there are strong norms against speaking out, which is why they're so secretive. Ironically, it's the weapon of fake news itself that is used against anyone who betrays the group. Yes, they can report me to Facebook. They could say, hack my page, post fake news. And if they present a convincing justification, Facebook believes them. Because in the end, this is all about the money. Big money. And while for now Facebook does seem to have slowed the tide of fake news from here, as long as our appetite for misinformation remains, there are plenty from around the world ready to feed it. Wow, that was Carl. This is Carl. What a fascinating story. What are your impressions of, of the people doing this that you met over there? It seems to me a bit like a startup kind of culture. They are. I mean, they're young, they're dynamic, they're entrepreneurial, they're, they're, they're out there finding opportunities and they're not monsters. I mean, they're doing something which is wrong and can have really harmful consequences for all of us, but they're also doing something which is actually giving them for once in their lives a decent living. Also, in their eyes, you know, they often think, well, this clickbait kind of says more about us than it does about them. I mean, they're simply trying to share us the content which we click on. So the motivation is obvious, they can make a lot more money than they can doing other jobs, but ultimately they are doing something which does no good. I mean, it is all the, 
the, the nasty stuff at the end of the web page that you know we're invited to click on. So, are there opportunities for these people to use their skills in a, a better way? There are far too few opportunities for them to do, for them to use their skills in any other way. So I've kind of began to see kind of fake news and clickbait, at least in the context of Kosovo, as a bit like a kind of cash crop of poppies. You know, it's something that doesn't do any good to the people that grow it. It doesn't do any good to us, the consumers. But for them, it's just the easiest and most accessible way of actually making a living. And you don't get rid of that problem just by burning the fields. You also get rid of the problem by giving the farmers, in this case, the clickbait merchants. You give them something else better to do. What do you make of the? Facebook reforms themselves, you know, the impact on those people and also how effective they've been. I mean, I think Facebook has, has been wielding a sledgehammer. I think just the worry is that it might not be hitting quite the right places. I mean, for sure, and time and time and time again, I heard that you know, group after group have been shut down. Facebook has been very active here. They're really trying to close the industry down. Um, but often I don't think they've discriminated themselves between groups which are sharing fake news and other groups which are simply sharing perfectly legitimate forms of content which they want people to click on, which frankly is what lots of people do all over the place. Do you think this is just an ongoing battle and you know Facebook closes down one method and these people just move to another and it's this cat and mouse game that will go on and on and on? I mean, the most, yes, I do. I mean, the most surprising thing to me was to find a kind of surface sector economy for fake news merchants. And as soon as you have that, as soon as you have specialists, you have programmers and coders, well, then you get innovation. And that means that the tools that are being sold in these groups are constantly changing. And as Facebook brings in one reform, or well, they bring out new tools and techniques and tips to try and get around it. So it is an arms race, it really is. And, and one that I'm not sure that Facebook will ever really be able to prevail in. I, th I simply think that it's one they're going to have to manage. Carl, fascinating job. Thank you. Thanks. Hello and welcome to The Week in Tech. It's been pretty bizarre. Bill Gates had his hands full, hopefully not literally, calling for better laboratory tech at the reinvented toilet expo in China. A 15-year-old Australian boy was crowned overall winner at the Drone Racing World Championships. And after several years of teasing, Samsung finally showed off its brand new, wait for it, wait for it, foldable phone. It does everything you'd come to expect from a phone, except it folds. Hmm, good. It was also the week that China State TV showed off a synthesized, artificially intelligent news anchor. And appearance are modeled on Zhang Zhao, a real anchor. He's not real! He's not real! Researchers at MIT have developed drone technology that could be used to find hikers that are lost in the wilderness. The autonomous system uses a 3D laser scanner to create a virtual model of the area, allowing the fleet of flying bots to work together and even tell each other if an area has already been mapped. And finally, a new bot marketed as the world's most advanced social robot proved that hats really are so last year. It projects different faces onto its head-shaped display and hopes to make human-robot interaction feel much more natural. Personally, I'm not creeped out at all. One of the most chilling examples of how convincing fake news could become is deepfakes. That's the term given to artificial intelligence techniques that swap people's faces in videos, seemingly seamlessly putting them into situations that never happened. We first covered the phenomenon earlier in the year when a user-friendly deepfakes app made the technique easy and freely available online. We all share the same home. It seems that the AI genie is out of the bottle. For a lot of kids, uh the doors that have been open to me aren't open to them. We're yet to see deepfakes make an impact in real news, but you can imagine the implications if we can't tell what's real. New tools developed by DARPA's Media Forensics Project claim to be able to automatically spot AI forgeries. One big giveaway? They rarely blink. Another potential giveaway is to look for signs of life Literally, subtle changes in skin tone, invisible to the human eye, that can reveal a human pulse. Currently, deepfakes algorithms can't consistently replicate these subtleties, but as the technique develops, how long will that last? 
So the future of this tech definitely has some murky possibilities, but we're starting to see some genuinely useful applications of it too. Here's Lara. Yes, there is definitely a dark side to fakery, but there are also some exciting possibilities. We've put a new algorithm to the test here at the BBC with newsreader Matthew and Rolliwalla. Today he's presenting, well, his own news in more languages than he can actually speak. I'm second generation British. My parents originally came to the UK in 1959. I joined him to watch the magic unfold. What did you think watching That's that? It's incredible, actually, and unsettling, because I know I can't do that, and then you see they've made me look as if I can. For this to work, the lighting and the camera angle need to be just right. I can't speak any This isn't video editing. The footage is broken down into data, with neural networks tracking his lip movements as well as those of voice actors who are speaking the same words, in this case in Hindi, Mandarin and Spanish. Now comes the trick. Because once the system has mapped out and understands how the mouths of both Matthew and the voice actors move, the software can switch these over, manipulating Matthew's lips to mouth the translated words. This is the brainchild of London-based startup Synthesia, a company dreaming of making affordable Hollywood-type special effects available to the masses. Although we tested it here in a news setting, it currently takes a whole day to create a digital model of a person. Of course, the aim is for this dubbing to be possible on any video, regardless of how it's been filmed. Although in a world where that becomes simpler, even the company itself can recognise the implications. So in regards to trust and videos and photos um, and what's going to happen in this sort of space, I think, you know, Photoshop was released in 1990. And uh, since then, it's become very easy to edit images. You can remove objects, you can edit the background, you can do all these things that, that is done to most of the images that you view on the internet or in magazines today, right? And the same thing is going to happen to video, I'm pretty convinced. And I think humans will also just adapt, society will adapt to the fact that just like we don't take photos at face value, we can't take videos at face value necessarily. So whilst the possibilities are exciting, we may just grow a little more suspicious of everything we watch. That was Lara with Matthew, who can now appear to speak Spanish, which is pretty darn clever. I suppose the only drawback to that technique is that it's not actually Matthew's voice that we're hearing, it's someone else's. But very soon, we may be able to go one better. Someone official, someone who must have looked in her bag and found something with her name on it. Juliet's love for Matteo had been one of the overwhelming wonders of her life. I'm using some technology that we first saw a few months ago, a speech synthesis system by Lyrebird AI. Just by listening to a few audio samples of someone talking, it can reproduce their voice digitally, like this. I am Donald Trump, and I think that my digital voice is quite impressive. The Lyrebird AI has been trained on many, many voices, and it's taught itself what makes each voice different. Now that means that you don't have to record every phoneme, every single sound that your voice can make because amazingly it's found a more efficient way of sounding like you. The kind of algorithms that we are using, it's something called deep learning or neural networks and uh, something that uh, makes these kind of algorithms special is that you don't need to give them specific things to look for. And so this DNA of, of the voice, we know that uh, you are able to synthesize new voices based on this and that they will sound like the original voices, but we don't really know what is inside of them. And so it's a bit of a black box. Version one was trained on American voices, which is why its synthesized voice had a slight American twang. But now I'm using a prototype of version two, which has been trained using Spanish voices. And this is the result. Hola a todos. Les quiero contar que aprendí español. Bueno, no es verdad. 
nunca he podido hablar español hasta ahora. Te doy gracias al iPad 2.0. Is this not just the same as taking what I'm saying, turning it into text, and then putting it through an online translation tool, and then getting the resulting text and putting it through Lightword? So not exactly, because, uh, for instance, there are some words in Spanish, the strong R, that uh, are not uh, common in some other different languages. And so we could make you pronounce that, uh, that sound in your voice, even if you were not able to, to pronounce it before. Why have you added this translation? So we, imagine if we could do movie dubbing uh, automatically. If you have a course on Mexican cooking, you could uh, have it uh, spoken in English or in Italian or in many other different languages on the same time as, as they are being released. Lyrebird has already used its tech for good, banking the voices of those with motor neurone disease so they can still use their voice after they lose their ability to speak. What motivates you? I want to make my best effort into preventing that this kind of technology is misused or it's used to fraud uh, or some people or it's used to steal the identities of people or to create political instability. Do you think it might be possible to deploy deep learning, neural networks, artificial intelligence to be able to spot the fakes? Definitely. And this is something that we are working internally as one of the potential preventive measures of this technology. However, I think that the problem with this is that long term is that uh, the generated and the, and the real will be basically uh, impossible to distinguish one from each other. And so that's why I believe that uh, the solution the ultimate solution to this kind of issue is educating the public and, and letting them be suspicious of the media. It's 100 years since the end of the First World War, which makes this Remembrance Sunday an even more poignant and special day. One of the many commemorations taking place around Commonwealth nations is being tested here at the Royal Chelsea Hospital a retirement home for British Army veterans. It's called Nothing To Be Written, and it's an immersive VR experience based around the sending and receiving of the so-called field postcards that soldiers wrote during the Great War. It has sort of parallels to text messages that people can send now, that thing where there isn't a lot of message that you can put into it, you can't tell the stories but it's just a connection to say, I'm okay, I'm thinking of you. And I thought that was really beautiful. A century after the end of the supposed war to end all wars, this is a highly emotive insight into what it was like both at home and in the trenches. There are no visuals here of the brutality of war. These guys have already seen too much of that. Absolutely incredible and it feels cold. The sun has come out bright. This is absolutely amazing. What I liked about wearing these during the, this um, session was the fact that I was looking up and looking at the sky and the colours in the sky. I thought that was brilliant. Can I take my headset off? Yeah. All right. Mm. That was so realistic. We were there in the trenches. What they did is what they wanted to do, and, and that is to protect the country. Many of them lost their lives. And I hope it's gone to people now these days that what it was all about, very emotional, because I was with them. <laughs> 